Good evening, good morning, good afternoon. Um, thank you everybody for turning up and for attending this uh, month's Kinect uh, presentation by Phil Wheat. Uh, Phil is a manager at Accounting Moon Labs. He used to work for Microsoft and Avenade as well, I believe. That's and cool. he's going to take us through when, uh, how, when, and where of developing with uh, Microsoft Kinect. Before I hand over to Phil, I'm just going to do a bit of housekeeping. First, there is, a, of course, a big thanks to our sponsors for their continued support uh, of our community. Uh, as always, that's very much appreciated. So thank you to Oxweb, Telerik, Safari Books Online, and Pluralsight. Uh, from me, we have Abby Caval, also doing Mixing Windows .NET and Open Source, uh, about mixing up your .NET development with the myriad of open source projects and tools that are now becoming available out there for us to use. Uh, and that's on the May the 24th. The last bits, um, the Vietnam team, Inba, me, Fida, Isaac, Asset, Raymond, and Dan. Uh, thank you very much for everybody's support and help. Uh, without you guys, we really wouldn't be able to do all of these events. Anybody have any questions to us? Uh, info at litnook.org. Or you can catch us on Twitter, on Facebook. And of course, keep up with our calendars uh, and see what events are coming from Eventbrite. And uh, last but not least, uh, not to forget that these events are recorded and are uploaded to our YouTube channel, and that's youtube.com slash litlock. But here we go. I'm going to hand over to Phil. Phil, thank you very much for taking time out and coming in and presenting uh, on what of Connect for us. Very much my pleasure. A moment while we pop over. <coughs> So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever it is, whatever time it is in your uh, locale. Uh, today we're going to be talking about Connect, um, basically going over the different pieces, the different, uh, a lot of people have actually worked with Connect or played with Connect on their Xbox 360s, but because the SDK is out, because there's a lot of interest in using it as a very new interface, uh, People are kind of looking at how do I work with this. So the first thing people do is when they pick it up is they go, I want to make a scanner, a 3D scanner or something like that. But there's a lot of different ways to actually use the Connect to do different things. Um, so that's what we're going to be talking about today, kind of how things go through and what, what we need to do there to really take advantage of it. I've got set the, the how, where, and when are the three sections. Uh, what I want to do is kind of go through, talk about the different capabilities. You're going to see a little bit of code, but most of it's going to be uh, more about how you interact with uh, Connect. Uh, I will try, if you have questions, please drop them in the uh, Q&A area. I'll try and check them at the end of each of the sections. I know some people can't stay around for the entire, pe the entire session, so I'd like to make sure that we get the questions answered, uh, but I don't want to kind of interrupt the flow as we go through. So that being kind of set up, uh, who I am. Uh, you heard just a little bit. I uh, just started this year with building up the labs division at Chaotic Moon. Uh, it's a mobility co company. Very uh, been doing things with uh, phones and with tablets and everything like that. Uh, what our job is to is to figure out what the next thing that Chaotic Moon is going to uh, conquer the world with. Um, one of the things we're looking at is the connect and some of the different things that are there. Uh, former evangelist with Microsoft and architecture and startups, but uh, very much tied in with the robotics team, very much tied in with the connect team, and all of those kind of things. Kind of the, again, what's new, what's next. Uh, and the other thing that's really inspired me to kind of look at how this all comes in is the maker movement. If, you, if any of you have seen what's going on with Make Magazine, with Maker Fairs, with the hacker spaces, with the ability for everybody to kind of not just do atoms but bits and not just bits but atoms, kind of bridging that software hardware gap. That's one of the things that as you start looking at these interfaces, as you start looking at how things come together, uh, knowing the hardware and knowing the software, it's it's no longer write a web page and 
you don't care what it is, you're just worried about the browser, you're trying to actually tie in the interfaces and try and tie in the environment with that user interaction, and you really kind of have to know where you know, both sides of the of the experience have to be able to work with those. Uh, my neglected blog, you can find at philweek.net. It actually goes over to philipweek.com. You'll see those uh, back and forth. I say it's neglected because I have trouble finding time to post. Uh, but if you if you just do a subscription or if you ask me questions on there, I'll be glad to come back and give you some information. I'll try and make sure and put up a post for questions from the uh, from this webcast in a little bit. Uh, and I can always be found on Twitter at pweet. Um, you can feel free to ping me there as well, and I'll be glad to uh, get you any information or any info. So why is the talk? There's been a lot of talk about next generation interfaces. And every time I hear about next generation interfaces, I hear about HTML5, I hear about XAML, I hear about native, I hear about uh, you know, Objective C, I hear about all of these kind of things that, okay, they're, they're, are they the next generation interfaces or are they just new ways of working with the interfaces we already have? Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's web, it's, it's, it's a browser, it's those kind of things. Then you look at user interaction and you hear everybody talking about the next generation of Multitouch. Well, guess what? Multitouch is already here. We've been living in that world for the past five years. That's kind of, it's there. I'm not saying it's not important. I say it's very valuable. But there are very specific use cases that that drives. That means that you have to be pretty much a single user interface. That means that only one person can be working with the data at a time. That means that the user has to have it at arm's length. They have to have something that they can touch. That it has to be generally something that they hold, otherwise their arms get tired. So these are kind of the things that they, that you look at with that. What we're going to talk about is how natural user interfaces can actually move away from the user touching something or actually working with data in traditional ways and move to gesture-based interfaces that don't require the user to touch things. Connect is the most uh, successful implementation of this. It's not the only one, but you know you can't argue with uh, $150 for getting it uh, as a user experience on your Xbox, $250 to get it in your applications that you work with uh, and that you can develop on. So we're going to kind of talk about how that changes, how you can interact, the different ways that you can do that, and the different places that it, that it opens things up. And then why me talking about this? Uh, one of the things uh, that kind of brought this about is that we at Labs have done a couple of projects. Uh, hopefully you've seen one or both of these that we've done with Connect this year. Uh, the top one that you can see is our Board of Awesomeness, uh, which is a motorized skateboard that goes 32 miles an hour. And you can see the Connect up on the front of it that you actually control it just using gestures, just using your hands. Uh, it looks up and tells what you're doing and drives along. It does things that is where we wanted to really push the boundaries. Uh, traditionally, you look at Connect and, and the, the product team has gone, you know, we want to work, you know, Connect, you put it in your living room. You control the lights. You make sure that there's not too much sun. You make sure that there's nothing moving in the background. You make sure that you're exactly, you know, six feet away to eight feet away or, or, or all of these kind of different things. And we wanted to see how far we can push it. So the Board of Awesomeness actually takes the Connect outside. Uh, we take it into sunlight and we're based here in, in sunny Austin, Texas. So that Texas sun can, uh, we, we were trying to see how far we can push it with that. We're put, we're actually aimed up at the blue sky. So how far we can we do that? The connect itself is moving, the, everything is moving but the person in front of it. So it's kind of an interesting, uh, what thing that we went in there. And I'll talk a little bit about that as we talk about, as I get into the different sensors and how you work with that. The second project you see on the lower right is our smarter cart. This was actually interesting enough that we went up to, uh, we were called up to uh, Redmond uh, for our, the, the R&D uh, showcase uh, by Microsoft, showing how we could actually use Connect uh, not just to work with, uh, you know, work with still images, but actually put it on a cart, actually have it follow you around a retail store, being able to give voice commands, being able to give you feedback through a tablet, and be able to actually work with uh, your data in the environment that you really want it in, rather than having to pull a phone out and you know push the cart with one hand, hold your cell phone with the other, and what do you shop with? We're actually trying to put those into place and, and do that. So when I talk about some of the scenarios and some of what's going on, 
this is some of the background of what we've looked at and what you can be thinking of when you go looking at uh, Connect and what, you're, what you can do with it. Uh, we actually have a couple of other projects that hopefully we can announce pretty quick that are doing some different things with Connect, and, and just keep an eye on that. I'll give you the URL to keep, to keep that watch on uh, at the end of the presentation. So to start off with, I always want to start from ground zero because I don't know if you've been working with Connect for, you know, for a year uh, since it first came out and the SDKs went into beta, or if you've just kind of started, you've been playing with it on your Xbox 360 and kind of just want to see how you can work with it yourself. So I start with the how and what you can actually, uh, what you can actually understand. Uh, there are two hardware versions is one thing you need to remember. There, there's been some different talks about various versions. Uh, currently, there are two, uh, two models. The Connect for 360, this is what you buy that you plug into your Xbox. This is the consumer piece. This is actually optimized specifically for, uh, for your Xbox. Uh, you can actually see it can be used for your SDK development. Uh, you can take that over. If you've got the uh, power supply, you can plug it in uh, to your PC. It actually works well. Uh, you can do all kinds of things as long as you're in debug mode. Um, there is some functionality that's not available on this because it is actually first generation uh, firmware. What you're looking at is uh, things like, and I'll, I'll talk about the difference there, but basically you're looking at near mode not being available and some of the video modes not being there, mainly because of the firmware itself. Um, it's not supported for production, so if you try and compile and deploy with an Xbox 360 Connect, uh, then you're not, it basically you're, you're going to get an error, and I'll talk about those again as we get further on into the Connect ticket. Connect for Windows uh, is the, the current version that's actually built for writing applications against on a PC. Uh, fully used for de development and deployment, uh, deployment, uh, excuse me, uh, full functionality. You get near mode, you get additional resolutions, uh, you get some updates on things. Uh, one of the other interesting pieces that I didn't mention here is that you actually uh, get a little bit smaller cable, shorter cable, and you get a small dongle that you'll notice in there that it actually helps with uh, some of the USB transients that can happen on a PC that they don't see on the Xbox. So you actually get, it, there actually are some significant differences between the two that, that uh, uh, means that you're able to do more with the Connect for Windows. And the SDK is really kind of built for that. And that support for production. So if you're actually going to compile your application, uh, going to put it out in production, if you're going to put it in, in uh, a kiosk, if you're going to put it in some, some place that users are going to actually work with it, if you don't have it, if you don't have uh, the Connect for Windows, then it's going to throw you an error. You're not going to build, uh, be able to work with that. The capabilities. So uh, remember, the hardware itself is the same between the two connects. Uh, it's the firmware that's different. The, the only hardware differences are that, that small dongle that you can actually move back and forth. Uh, but the, the connect for Windows has a shorter cable. Really, that's the only difference in the hardware itself. The, for both of them, the cameras are, are an RGB, RGB camera has a 320 by 240, 640 by 480, and for Connect for Windows, the firmware allows a 1024 by 768. There are different uh, refresh rates that are on each of these, so uh, once we get into the actual camera itself, I'll show you the different, for the, the different refreshes, and you'll be able to kind of see how you can do those trade-offs. Uh, the depth camera itself has 320 by 240 and 640 by 480. And uh, so you can actually go into that and you can see what's going on there. There's actually another mode that some people use, which is 80 by 60. Um, I, I, I didn't put it on here because, to be honest with you, I, I'm not sure uh, how useful that is, but I, I didn't put it on the slide here, but that is part of Connect itself. Uh, and the depth camera, which is actually the laser, pre the laser projector and the, uh, the depth kind of coming back in, the, inf the infrared camera. Uh, the thing to know about that is that you're looking at uh, 0.8 meters to 4 meters for depth information on standard mode and 0.5 meters to 3 meters on near mode. Near mode is only available with Connect for Windows, uh, which allows you to kind of get up a little bit closer to be able to actually do some of those scenarios that uh, that uh, are more interactive with a PC or with with that type of uh, that type of scenario. And we'll talk a little bit more about how, what those differences are there. Uh, for the audio itself, you have a microphone array. This is very, very useful. It's a four mic array, and if you've ever seen things about noise canceling microphones, 
uh, you know there's an N plus one scenario, which if you got, uh, which means you, with four micro microphones you can do up to three audio sources discreetly. But this also means that you can do directional steering and detection steering. What this means is that with uh, the Connect microphones, it can actually give you the direction that it ch that it received the sound from. And you can actually uh, tell it for speech recognition, I only want to listen on certain vectors or I want to steer towards a certain vector to get higher confidence level. Very, very interesting, very, very powerful. Uh, for the audio stuff, I, I haven't seen as much information around on developing on that. We've actually found it very useful uh, when we're working with the uh, smarter card because the card itself is in a very noisy environment. There's a lot of things going on. Being able to actually tell where the user is and be able to steer that uh, recognition to them has really helped us with our, uh, with our basically our speech recognition. And then there's the tilt uh, mechanism itself. This is actually tilt from negative 27 to 27 degrees from horizontal. I mentioned accelerometer because not a lot of people are aware of this, but that's actually off, not off of a uh, direction on the Connect itself. But that's also, there's an accelerometer inside the Connect that says, even if it's mounted uh, off, off true, uh, off uh, the horizon, then uh, the accelerometer will actually make sure that that negative 27 to 27 is from horizontal. So uh, again, we actually we learned this out with the smarter cart because we were trying to, to just trick it out just a little bit and have it point down a little bit further. Uh, we didn't need quite as much up angle, but we were looking for down. And with our custom mount, we actually tried it, and it didn't work so well. So uh, one of those things that uh, being able to know what's going on and be able to know how it works really makes a difference. Uh, the software net capabilities, the cameras itself, both the RGB frames and, and depth frames, are, are event-driven or polled. Um, depending upon how you want to, we always do event-driven because we like to pick up every frame. We may want to drop the frames if, we, if we're if we processing too quickly, but it's always good to do that. If you don't need every frame, if you're doing something that you need processing based on whatever's happening at the point, you can actually pick that up and poll it. Uh, skeleton tracking the same way. You can get those events. You can pop it in. You can look at your skeleton uh, your, your skeleton groups, or you can uh, pull those and just find that information when you need it. And then there is uh, announced for Connect for Windows. This is one of those things that I'm very interested in personally. Uh, the seated skeleton tracking. Right now, uh, the skeleton tracking is based around standing uh, and how people look when they're when they're standing up. Uh, Connect for Windows 1.5 uh, SDK is scheduled hopefully this month, and we're going to get some additional capabilities around that. For the audio, voice recognition is English right now, but again, for that Connect for Windows 1.5, we're going to, you know, we're supposed to pick up uh, French, Spanish, Italian, and Japanese. You can see all this on the Connect for Windows blog. Again, I've got the URL for that later on, but it's, it's useful, especially if you're doing things uh, such as, I mentioned, kiosks or, or working with the public, being able to have multiple languages is, is very, very valuable. So that's kind of what's going on with the standard pieces. Uh, this is some of the stories we've, we've learned about Connect as we've gone through our different projects. Uh, the hardware items, Connect needs 12 volts for operations. Uh, this is why when you look at your Connect, it's got, it looks like a USB connector, but it doesn't fit in USB. Uh, this is because one side of it actually is USB 2.0, but the other side is actually providing 12 volts from a power supply. If you use the, when you buy the Connect for Windows uh, hardware, it includes the power supply. If you do your Xbox power, Xbox uh, 360 Connect, uh, then it may or may not have the power supply, depending on if you get it with an Xbox Slim, which does not come with the power supply because the Xbox Slim has the custom connector. If you have the, uh, if you have it separate, uh, it has the power connector because it needs to work with the older, older connects that didn't have that special bus. Uh, just to be aware of that, know that you do need to put that in when you pull it out of the box and try and drop it into your USB connector and it doesn't fit, that's for a reason. Uh, the connect tilt motor is, is update limited through the SDK. This is to prevent overheating. If you use some of the uh, non-Microsoft SDKs, those aren't guaranteed to do the uh, to do the rate limiting. You can actually overheat the, uh, the little servo motor in there. If you see something about may damage the hardware, this is what they're talking about. If you actually send it more updates that can handle, you can actually burn out the little motor in there. So be aware of that. Uh, to be honest with you, the, the motor itself is very useful for having different angles, different directions, you know, to keep people in the frame. But uh, I'm sorry? Ah, 
we must have a, a jump somewhere. Uh, but knowing that, we, we just uh, just be aware of that as you're doing your development. There are lenses available to reduce the focus range because of that depth depth range that I told you about. Uh, some things you want to get a little bit closer. When we did the board of awesomeness, of course, you're not going to be six feet away from the uh, from the front of the skateboard, no matter how long long the long board is. We actually used one of those lenses there, and it actually worked. Uh, reasonably well. Do know that it does produce distortion and it's not supported. Uh, depending upon what you need and what you're working on, know that that's going to be that there are going to be some issues if you look at that. Uh, Connect has a fan to prevent overheating. You may see it come on, especially if you're doing a lot of processing on the Connect itself. If you're putting it in an enclosed area like a kiosk, uh, you could get overheating. Be aware. Just make sure that you've got plenty of ventilation and that you know that that could be a, a, a noise source as well. And the last piece on this, on the hardware items, is Connect contains a USB hub internally. If you try and hook it through a powered USB hub, I mean, or even powered or unpowered, uh, it may or may not work. It is certainly not supported. It is, uh, uh, you, you need to know that uh, Connect itself uh, takes a huge amount of a full USB controller uh, bandwidth. So know that, that uh, officially none of it supported. We actually managed to find a couple that would work, but we did have some issues with that. If you, uh, if you can avoid it at all, uh, even if you want to live on the edge, I rec highly recommend that you uh, give it its own U straight USB connection. So connecting to your connect. So uh, we, I've talked a lot about the hardware itself. Let's talk about the software behind it. The big piece that you need to know here is connectsensor.connectsensors.count. This tells you how many connects that you can actually have. The SDK actually supports up to four connects uh, uh, connected to your machine. That being said, you need to make sure that you've got four USB, separate USB controllers to be able to pull those in. Remember, I said it takes about 60% of a, a full, not a uh, not a port, but a full controller of bandwidth to have the Connect pushing data back and forth through there. And that's why you'll actually see some of the frame rates changing as we go through on the different settings. Uh, so going through there, normally you're probably only going to have one, but just check to make sure that you have at least one Connect. Uh, once you do that, then you can actually check. Then I pull that connect out of there, uh, work with that, and then you get the connect sensor dot status. This is something that when we went into RTM or RTW or whatever we're calling uh, release to production uh, today for the uh, SDK, this came in, and it is a very, very nice thing to be working with and to be aware of. Uh, basically, your connect status is what you want to see is connected. Um, what you will not always see is that though. one of the things we've actually worked with with real world since we have connects moving around, we have them in different modes, we actually have them running off battery power uh, for that is that we've had to worry about a lot of these others. I've never seen device not genuine, but that's if there's if someone puts some non-connect connects out there. Um, I'm, I'm sure they've got that out there for for licensing reasons. Device not supported. This is this is what you'll get when you put the Xbox 360 connect in there and you you program for production. You'll come up there and say, "Yep, we've got a connect, but it's not. not I can't use this mode with this hardware." Uh, Disconnected, this is if you lose connection with the Connect itself. This is if someone plug, unplugs it, does things like that. If you don't catch that, if you don't check for that, then you're going to have some exceptions and you're not going to be very happy, or you just won't get anything back. And, and you're, you're, if you're event-driven, then things will get very interesting. Uh, error is just error. You know, something's going wrong. I can't tell you what. Here's the interesting ones that you, the, these last four are the ones that I really always like to touch on when you're putting, when you're connecting to your connect. Uh, you want to check and see if it's initializing. This means that uh, your apps come up, it's connected to the connect. There is a time period where you're actually connected to it, but the connect itself is getting its, uh, all of its processors in place, getting its state. This, it can be a mistake for many seconds, uh, depending upon the light level, depending upon uh, various uh, situations. You want to pay attention to this one and not try and ask for things before that's coming on. You're asking for exceptions and doing exception handling. Just make sure that you're ready and you're in that connected state, not in initialization. Insufficient bandwidth. This you can actually check on. Uh, you should check on this and, and work with the uh, status changed to make sure that something else doesn't get plugged in. If you're working with a desktop application or something where the users may plug, may plug in or unplug, uh, other devices, 
uh, this can happen while your application is running at any time. So if somebody plugs in, say, my USB headset into the same controller as the Connect, and we, overhead, you know, we go over uh, bus limits, then you'll get this, and you'll need to figure out what, what you need to do because let the user know, hey, whatever you just did, undo it, or gracefully uh not gracefully degrade whatever you're doing or just, you know, say, hey, I can't work anymore. But just know that this one can pop up at any point. Not powered is something that if you're doing a mobile, something like we did with the uh, with the robotics controls and the, the, the drivers giving us the power or separate uh, power controllers off the skateboard, knowing that uh, you're getting 5-volt five power, five power well, but you're not getting 12 volts to the right level. This could be that it's going undervolt, that you don't have connection, that whatever, and know that you can actually get some information off the connect itself, but uh, this generally kills the depth information because you're not project, you're not doing the laser projection, and you're not going to be able to do the, the tilt. So you can finesse this one a little bit, but know that you're probably getting uh, your batteries low or something's happening there. It can be a, a double check on there. And then not ready is kind of that second version of initialization. Uh, normally what you'll see with this is if the cameras are ready but the audio is not or some of those kind of pieces, so you're actually be able to come in there and put it in place. I know that uh, took a little bit of time on that, but these are things that as you're working with the Connect itself, you need to tie in with the uh, status change event and keep an eye on these because these are uh, pretty critical in the real world. I mean, unlike... Uh, what you've seen with other uh, other devices or things like that where, you know, if the uh, USB device goes away, then there are other things to fall back on. With Connect, you kind of have to know what's going on and be able to work with what devices are going away and what pieces happen and what you can actually work with. So that's kind of the how, all the pieces, all of what's happening in, in the play, in, in Connect itself. What we're now going to talk about is probably the more interesting piece which is the win. What do you do? Uh, we've got the capabilities. Now, how do we actually work with these capabilities? How do we make them uh, uh, come into place? How do we actually take advantage of them in different applications? So, simplest of all is video frames. You see my my wonderful little shot there. This is actually from the Smarter Cart, where we're actually taking frame shots and be able to show where the user is and doing some some tracking there. Uh, this is actually behind. This is actually on the cart itself, so you can actually see what's going on with the cart. We can actually take these and push these out wherever you want to go. Now to see the code itself, the uh, I'm just for these first pieces as we're going through. I'm just going to show the code here in the. Um, Basically here in the uh, uh, PowerPoint. Once we do the once we do this, then I'm going to run over and show you probably one of the best tools that you can use for for learning Connect and working with it is the Connect Explorer, which you get with the Connect SDK. We're going to talk about kind of what's going on here with the code, and then we're going to each piece we're going to go over. I'm going to show the Explorer itself, and hopefully we've got enough bandwidth that you can see what's going on. So the first thing you need to do is enable the stream. Uh, color stream enable, and you've got an enumeration for that, which is color image format. There's different re RGB resolutions. Uh, the standard one that I normally work with is 640 by 480 because we get those uh, 30 frames per second. You can actually go for lower resolution. Uh, you, you can actually go for, actually for this. You actually go with a uh, a lower frames per second if you want to conserve bandwidth on that on that USB bus, or you can go for a higher resolution and get a lower frames per second. So uh, when I go over to the Connect Explorer, I'll show you the different uh, resolutions that you can do there. But just know that you've got a couple of options here that you can work with. Then you act, once you get that set up, you start the, sen the Connect sensor itself, which means that it starts, uh, starts its data stream, start everything in place, and tie in the, uh, the uh, color fr image frame Ready event handler. So once you get that in place, I always like doing event driven because it makes things a lot more efficient. So you tie that in, and then you have your handler below that, and you can actually see this is where things get kind of fun. When you come back in, you're going to get a, um, you're going to get on your event args. You're going to have to open up that color image frame. This is basically the frame itself that's, that you're working with there. Check to see if it's null. When you're getting these frames in, you can't always be guaranteed that you're going to get a frame when it comes back. What happens with this is, depending upon what's happening here, I'm working with C, C Sharp, uh, you could miss it because of various system level information, various uh, pieces. If the next frame has already started, it's going to give you a null on this frame handler, even though it's told you there's a frame, uh, frame ready. So you need to check that and see. 
if you're looking at the SDK itself, you notice I'm checking for color pixel data for my own buffer. Uh, what you always want to do is set that up outside uh, of your event handler here, uh, set it as part of your, your class. The reason why you want to do that is you want to be able to actually work with your own copy of that so that once it goes up to that next level, once the other threads pick up and start filling up that next frame, you still have your frame to work with and you're able to work with, do what you need to. Do that image copy pixel data too and put it in your own buffer. And then you see right here probably the simplest use of that uh, frame is I take that, I take a uh, source that I've got copy those over, put a bitmap source in there so I can actually take my video image, which is on my uh, WPF uh, interface, put the source over there, and I can keep animating that. And what I'm doing here is actually showing uh, showing the camera output just on a uh, WPF image uh, control. Very easy, very simple. Uh, you don't have to do that. What happens is if you want, once you've got that buffer, you can actually do everything from doing edge detection, color options, all of those kind of things that you can come in and put into place. It becomes whatever you want to do. Just know that you've actually got a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, time pressure because you are getting those frames in. The higher the frames per second, uh, the, the faster you need to process those. Uh, you don't want to back those up and actually have to worry about multiple ones at the same time. The other piece is as well is once you've got that copied out, make sure you do a dispose on your color image frame instantiation because you need to do that. It gives you that when you when you come in there, but you want to make sure and do the dispose so that the front, you don't have a lot of uh, memory standing around. So we've kind of talked about that in the code itself. Let me flip over to the Connect Explorer and show you what we've got there and instead of uh, just talking your ear off about what the code is. And hopefully you can see this and my smiling face. This is my... Uh, this is basically the color stream that we're working with right here. You can see with the Connect Explorer, it's a very nice interface. We can actually put everything together. We've actually got our RGB resolutions so that we can actually see which ones we want. We can actually change down to a different resolution. We're actually doing 15 frames per second. I'm not sure how well the frames are coming across live meeting, but over here I can see it jittery. And then I can actually go up to the high resolution, which, which because I'm using the Connect for Windows, and you can see it's a lot higher resolution, but we're down to 12 frames per second. So we can actually go back and forth. Uh, we can actually change these on the fly. There are events to tell you uh, what's going on. Uh, if you're changing the frames per second, if you're changing the resolution, so you can actually change your buffer size and all of that, all that's available for you through the SDK itself. So we'll jump back over. Uh, Uh, we didn't see, uh, everyone said we couldn't see anything. Let me try one more time. Thank you very much. Um, let me try one more time to see, see if we can get that Connect Explorer. It, it looked like it was okay here. Uh, if someone can tell me if they're seeing. Light gray. Phil. Light gray? Okay. Well, I apologize about that. I will not do any more of the... Uh, Connect for Windows, uh, the, the Connect Explorer. Uh, we'll just go with the uh, with the presentation. I apologize about that. I was I was worried that that was going to be the situation, but uh, I was I was hopeful. <laughs> so, uh, if you want to if you want to try it yourself, uh, the Connect Explorer is actually part of the uh, Connect for Windows SDK. Uh, it's built it's pre built for you if you've already got the uh, Connect in, in place. And you don't even have to run up Visual Studio, uh, but if you don't, then uh, uh, if you don't have that, then uh, or, or if you've got Visual Studio installed, then you can actually go in and see how all this code is interacting with everything else. So we kind of talked about the video frames. Uh, we're going to now talk a little bit about the depth frames. With video, you know, we, we kind of I kind of mentioned what we're looking at with uh, you know everything that you would normally do with a webcam. You know, if you're going to do that though. Why not just use a webcam? It's a lot less expensive. It's a lot, uh, you can get a lot more resolution with a lot of those. There's a lot of those kind of things. Well, the main reason is, excuse me, because we can get things like the depth frames coming into place. We can actually get what's happening uh, around there and get an actual, a lot more experience about what's going on in our environment. You can see here from the photo, this is another one of the screenshots from our uh, smarter cart that uh, you can see that basically it's telling me every place uh, every pixel on the on the uh, 
on the frame, I can actually tell how far away that pixel is. Uh, we're getting that. It looks we, we've adapted this for for looking at a grayscale or image, but those are actually depths. You can actually see on kind of the lower right where it goes very dark. That's where I'm actually too close. I was reaching towards the camera, and I was too close for it to register. And farther away, you can see, again, it goes to, hey, it's out of range as well. So how do you work with this? Uh, the depth frames, it's going to look very interesting, very much similar to what you're work we were working with with the, uh, with the video frames itself. The, top, the front is, you can see, exactly the same way. We, you enable the depth of image format, and these formats are a little bit different. Uh, basically, we've got the 80 by 60, which is a 30 frames per second resolution. We've got the 320 by 240, which is a 30 frames per second, and a 640 by 480, which is also a 30 frames per second. Uh, because of the bandwidth and because of what you're looking at here, uh, take as, uh, try and take it as small as possible. Uh, you'd be surprised at how effective that can be uh, with even lower resolution, uh, with lower resolution depth frames, being able to know what's going on in different areas, different quadrants, different things there. Um, one of the, uh, basically coming down there, you'll actually see the, the, pretty much exactly what we're doing with the, with the video. We're actually doing that, picking up the image frame, setting up our buffer, but we've got to do a little bit of processing once we get that to be able to understand because what we're getting off of there, the Connect team was a little bit um, uh, efficient when they were bringing that out, and there's a player index that's on your depth frames. When you're actually working with the, with the uh, depth frames, there's some processing going on as well that can actually get, tell you not just how far away it is, but if you're tracking users, it can actually tell you what user is, it thinks is in that area. This is one of those interesting parts that, it, that uh, comes into play that makes things very, uh, very nice. You can get lots of information if you're working with people, uh, especially if you're working with lots of people, but you do have to do some processing. You can actually see here for each of the pixels, the X and Y, uh, you have to take that depth image frame and shift it. So it gives you the, the uh, frame itself tells you what the player index bitmap width is, and you do uh, that shift, bitmap shift to be able to come back out and just get the number. If you don't do that, then you're going to get really strange numbers, and you're not going to be able to do very much with that. So going in here, putting this in place, once you can do that, one of the things that you actually work with with the, uh, with the depth is things like taking quadrants in there. What, what we're doing with the, uh, with, what we started out with with the Board of Awesomeness is we work with the skeleton data and found out some interesting things, which I'll talk about when we get to that point. But what we had to do for the uh, for the environment was back it down and just use the straight depth frames and do our own processing. So we actually have for the hands we have hit boxes that the that the hands go into, so that we can actually just read the depth, get the average on there, get the closest. We're actually working with several of those uh, functionalities to be able to go in there and say, here's what we've got, here's what we need, here's what we want to do. Uh, uh, depending upon the different depths that we see in different areas on the screen. So know that there's a lot of interesting things that you can do there uh, to work with that. Once you get that information, you can actually work with where, does the where is the closest point on the, uh, you know, on the screen, where has it moved from, where are there gaps between different uh, things of the same, uh, the same uh, distance. And there's a lot of things that you can do with that, especially if you can do some of the shape recognition. I know people who are actually working on doing finger recognition with Connect, uh, uh, just using the depth and doing some of their own processing. So there's a lot of interesting things you're doing there. Just remember, if you're in near mode, you're looking at uh, you're looking at, uh, a uh, a still, you're looking at 0.3 meters away. If you're in standard mode, you're looking at further away. If you get any closer than that, you don't get a out of range close. You just get an out of range. You need to worry about that as you're going for through the processing. And the one that everybody loves, uh, skeleton tracking. And this is where I'm actually going to be a little uh, sad that I can't run the Explorer because this is the one that really everybody loves to see and is really, really valuable. Uh, as you look at the picture here, this is one of the shots of uh, you can see two people there, and you can see all of the uh, joints that it tracks. 
uh, the, the, uh, what you have to do here is actually put the difference, uh, the lines in between the joints. All you get is, is basically a point cloud of what the joints are and what that person is. There's a lot of interesting things here that you can do with it. Uh, to be honest with you, one of the simplest things you can do that we, a little trick that we do on a lot of our applications is just simply see if we have a skeleton. Uh, a very difficult question that you can ask a computer is, is there a person in this, in this frame? Uh, there's a lot of SDKs that work on different things. They do a lot of processing. Um, Connect makes it incredibly easy to, know, to, to answer the question, is there a person in front of me? You just basically say, is, are there at least one skeletons being tracked? If there are, now you can know you're, there's a person there, and you can start doing some of those interactions with them. Very, very useful, uh, very quick trick. Working with that skeleton tracking, you can actually see this is going to be a little bit smaller. I apologize, but we're working with a little bit more code. Uh, you should start, this should look fairly familiar on the setting it up. Again, they're working, the team has been very good about being standard with how the streams are put into place. You enable the stream itself. There's no question about different resolutions or things like that. You just want to enable the stream it, as it goes forward. Uh, set it up as it's ready. You can do the poll. Again, I do event handling. Uh, know that when you're doing event handling, though, you probably do need to have something else for an event drive because the skeleton, uh, that the skeleton events happen only when skeletons are recognized, and depending upon how things go or how uh, how things move, uh, you can get skeleton uh, uh, not you can not get events happening for longer relative long periods of time. So I, uh, sometimes up to tens of seconds, depending upon how things are going. So don't have your event loop just run off of this. Make sure that you always, uh, always have another event uh, timer if you're doing fully event. I like to do the video frame because normally I like to have that up in place so the user can see what's going on as well. And you know that you're going to get those frames per second at least reasonably close to what the, the standard frames per second are. What you're getting here is the skeleton frame itself. You, what you want to do is check and see if you've got skeleton data on there. Um, if you don't have any skeleton data, then you, know, you, know, you want to make sure that you've got something, uh, you, that you are getting a skeleton back. If there is, is skeleton data, though, you want to check and see how many skeletons are in there. Connect can actually track up to four uh, people at a time in a low resolution, but generally you're only going to get two in uh, implicit tracking mode. So what you want to look at there is you'll actually see something we're doing here with the free skeleton. We want to check and see if it's tracked. You can have a skeleton that's not tracked that may be lost that you've got data on that's moved away. Uh, and you want to check that tracking state and see what's going on there. And you want to check and see if you see this skeleton that I haven't found one yet. I'm walking through and making sure that there's one there. There's actually another piece when you're working with those skeletons that you get a tracking ID off of those. Uh, what you can do with that is you can actually set, tell when skeletons move back and forth, you can actually tell if they go out of order. You can tell if, if things are going differently. You can actually put it into place and say, I want to know, make sure that I've got whatever that one's doing. So I can tell if Phil has moved behind or in front of, or we lost him for a second and he moved to the other side of whoever he's he's interacting with at the same time with Connect. You can go, to go in there and put those into place. You can put all that you want in there. You can also see that uh, one of the things we're doing with some of the some of the navigation is this skeleton dot position. You can actually check the position of each of those joints, and I'll show you the, the different joints you can check on in, ju in a, just a second. But you can actually say, I don't need super high resolution. What's going on? We actually started out working with the hip with the uh, hip positions for figuring out where the person was, going to work with what they're doing. Uh, what the the Connect for Windows uh, RTM actually dropped in, just the skeleton itself. Give me the position. It doesn't need to know all the details. It doesn't need to know what exactly what you're doing. You can just say, how far away is that person, what direction it is, it is across X and Y, X, Y, and Z. So be able to come in there and say, here's where that person is, because at that point I can work with that and, and really make it happen. Um, that being said, everybody likes to go in and put the details in there. The, uh, skeleton, the skeleton point itself is a X, Y, and Z coordinate. These are relative to the camera itself. So uh, depending upon if you're doing frames or you're doing uh, video, that's what's coming into place, and it's what, what the Connect itself is looking at. So uh, your Z is how far away. X and Y is exactly what it says. It's a right-hand uh, coordinate system, so you hold out your right hand, you put it uh, to where the 
to where the Z, which is your thumb, is out, and you can see where the positive is on the X and Y axis as well. Uh, the joint type tells you which joints you're looking at. You get a collection of those that come back at we come back. There's no guaranteed order on those, mainly because things can be tracked or not tracked, depending on how you're doing there. So you, you need to actually check and see which, uh, which joint's there. You get all the joints back in with, with the enumeration, but you'll need to check and see which one of them there are. Ankle left, ankle right, you can read all of those there. So you can actually see all the different uh, uh, points that you get back. But the, interest, but the uh, key point there is uh, check the tra joint tracking state on each of those joints. Because you get them back, it uh, doesn't mean that the Connect actually knows where they are. Uh, they can get, you can get a not tracked or tracked, which is I don't see it or I, or I think I see it or I think I know where it is. But then there's also the inferred. Inferred is, is where it may, maybe your hand is behind your back, but it thinks can figure out from where the other joints are on your arm. It could be that uh, the, your skeleton is cut off, and you actually get this on the skeleton itself, where it's cut off top or cut off bottom or cut off to the side. So it can actually tell you, I'm unsure of different points in here, and you can see why that may be, because if, uh, if, if I could have run the Connect Explorer right now over the, over the video, it would have shown... Uh, it would have shown basically that where I'm standing right now, uh, I'm cut off. Basically, you can see me to about uh, uh, below my belt, and everything below that is an inferred or not tracked. This is something that you need to be aware of. This is you know, telling you not join where the joints are, but how confident the system is. Remember, these are always estimates. Even when it says this is tracked, you need to be able to handle jittery data. When I say jittery, you can actually see things move very, very rapidly between two points or actually be very far off where the, the video says that it probably is. Um, it does a great job of doing the tracking, but as you're working with this with the uh, skeleton, be prepared to do averaging. Be prepared to do uh, to look at things that make sense. If you actually see the uh, the user's hand at a 90 degree angle from their wrist backwards, uh, you know you may need to, you may feel that those aren't the best. Uh, that's not the best confident level that you that you should have over what they're doing. And well, that's the problem. Uh, and one of the things I don't have on here is you can actually set different tracking modes on the skeletons, so you can actually know what's going on. Default tracking is it tries to kind of set them up and keep them in order, put them in place, which you can actually tell it is. All I want to know is what the closest player is. And, and with player, uh, this is coming from the, the Connect for 360. They're trying to keep consistent between the two. You'll see whenever you're talking about skeletons, you're talking about players. Uh, closest player, well, you can see the one on player. The first one it sees, it tries to stay on that. Even if it's seeing others, uh, you can do sticky on two players. So it tries to keep those even if you get those two. Uh, to explicit uh, tracking in there, you can actually say, I want to take the first two and work with that. And again, you'll see the most active one and two. So if you want to be able to say, I want to see the ones that are being more interactive, let me actually show those, and those can move around. This is where you use those tracking IDs I mentioned that are part of the uh, part of the skeleton data to know when you're actually changing those, especially if you're doing the most active or closest, because those two, one, one or two, may change who it is, even though it's still tracking. The one that you're trying, the one that you're pu pulling up, is not going to be the same one each time, and you want to be able to know what's happening there. When you, this is for a lot of multi-user, multi, uh, multi-person tracking. If you're working with kiosks, if you're working with kind of what we do with the uh, smarter cart, this is very, very important. If we've got, you can think of when you've got a uh, cart moving through a busy store, you want to make sure that you don't go off wandering, following someone else. The other thing you can actually do here, and we actually do for a, a double check on security uh, above and beyond what's going on with the uh, with the enumerators there here, is we actually do things like uh, take the we actually take the shoulder uh, left, uh, the which one we do the hip center, shoulder left, and the head, and we check the color. We actually store that away. We actually translate that over and check with a video frame and say, what color do we have on that one? And we're actually, what we're actually doing is trying to check and see you know, what color is your shirt, maybe what color is your, your, your hair, uh, and what color pants you're, working, you're wearing. And what we're doing with those is doing a double check. When we're coming in and we're saying, what's this, what's this user? This is telling us what we've got. This also lets us know where, uh, where if we lose tracking and we can't get it back, we can actually start looking through this other skeletons if something's happened that the tracking ID has changed because of the recognition has, uh, 
has had a problem, then we can actually go through and say that's close enough, it's fuzzy enough, we're going to that we're going to move over to this tracking ID and pick those up. So it's a very simple piece to do, but as you're working with these, make sure that you're working with not just the skeleton data, but what you're seeing on the depth, what you're seeing on the video, because that's how the software itself is working. That's how it's coming into place. One more thing on this is remember that uh, the, skeleton, uh, the skeleton data is fairly processor intensive. It's being done on your, on your processor, not on the Kinect itself, and being done from the video and the depth in information. So if you don't need it, don't instantiate it. Uh, it'll help you a lot with your processing power. If you do need it, uh, it's, it's really, really useful, but just know that it's uh, probably the least I won't say reliable because I really like it and it's giving me a lot of, uh, of useful information, but you're going to have to do a lot of checks. Don't trust it. Trust that it's completely accurate. Know that it's an estimate of what you're doing there. And now we go over to speech recognition. And I apologize. I don't have a, a screenshot for this one. Uh, it's, it is speech, so we're kind of talking about this. Um, building grammar is uh, very accessible and relatively pain-free. It's a bit more code than the others, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to see if I can flip over to Visual Studio after we do this and kind of show you some of the code in there. That being said, if you've ever done voice recognition, speech recognition before, uh, this is going to make things very, very easy. Uh, traditionally, it's been a lot of pieces, a lot of, uh, a lot of items that you have to keep in sync, a lot of different pieces, different uh, things that are in there. The Connect team has actually taken a lot of the speech recognition technology that Microsoft puts together tied it in, really optimized it for those four, uh, for those four microphones, and done a lot of work to, to, to make it very accessible for you. Uh, key items are, once you start the recognizer, it can take up to four seconds uh, for it to be ready. Uh, four seconds sounds super easy, unless you're thinking about a splash screen or what you need to do to make sure that the uh, users aren't sitting there waiting for four seconds, um, you know, and indicating when it can actually recognize speech. Uh, I've never had longer four seconds than trying to make sure it's up when, when we we're on camera and the system's trying to figure out, get everything in order uh, when we've launched it. So be, be aware that that's one of those interesting things you have to work with. Uh, a very nice capability is recognition for each of your commands has a confidence level of zero to one. Uh, you're almost never going to get a one. Normally what we're looking at, depending on the environment, is 0.6 to 0.7 is pretty good. Anything above 0.8 is great. You're in, in really good environment. You're actually able to pick up a lot of, uh, a lot of piece there. Know that you're not always going to be able to get things recognized perfectly. Know that you're going to need to be able to, to work with that and, and have a recovery mode if the, if the recognition doesn't come in quite exactly the way you want it to be. Uh, results are text. They come back out when you do the when you do the event handler. It'll give you back that text that you put in that said you're looking for, and basically you're working with a big case statement to figure that is out. Uh, you can set uh, uh, you fit, do it use a grammar builder. You give it commands. You you add those in and you work with whatever's happening there. Uh, multiple com word commands are helpful for disambiguation. Uh, but chain commands work much better. What I'm talking about here is that when you do that grammar builder, you can actually send in text with multiple words in it, uh, separated by space, like uh, launch application. Those are two different words. It'll actually try and match those together to put them in place. Uh, you can actually make chain gram nested grammars. Uh, the system actually helps you with that. It's a little more complex to do to make sure you get everything in place, but it is incredibly helpful to be able to have those multiple commands so you can actually limit the false positives. Being able to do, uh, you know, uh, uh, connect, start, app. Having those three, if you get a recognition on connect, start, app, that's going to be a fairly complex match, but if you're actually able to, connect, to do serially, you know, connect, and then start, and then app, and you get good confidence on each three of those, and they're in that order, now you've got a much higher confidence that you're getting everything right, that everything's coming into place, and that you've got what you need to have. So this is one of those pieces, as we're putting in there, that things are very, very useful. The other piece is, if you're actually, work, again, with using not just one of these features, but the features in, 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 uh, in conjunction with each other, uh, that... Uh, when, when I was doing the skeleton tracking uh, just pr uh, previously, what we also do is that skeleton.position. That lets us know where the person is. 
we use that for some of our navigation for the cart and lets it follow them around and make sure that, that it's there. But the other piece that we actually do is in the noisy environments, we actually do some of the steering. So some of the, some of the recognition steering. So I can actually tell the microphone, I'm going to do manual steering. You don't have to do this. The, the Connect itself will do automatic steering. It'll try and figure it out and, and do the, the best it can. But if you know that I've only got one person I want to follow and I don't know where they are, I can actually say my application is going to control the steering of the, of the audio recognizer, and I'm going to give you the vector uh, that you want to listen on. When you do this, you actually really, really increase the capabilities of the speech recognizer to be able to go in and make that happen, to be able to put it in place and say, I know this is who I want to listen to if something else is over there. On the other hand, when you do this recognition back in, you also get the vector that you that the sound came from. So if you've got more than one user that's that's giving commands, this is one of those places that you can actually flip it around. Use these use that skeleton tracker to tell you which player gave you that. You get a command, but you can actually tell who gave you the command. Be able to drop in and say, oh, I've got it from this vector. I've got player two on that vector. Therefore, he's the one that gave the command. So you can actually very easily go in with you know with, with some confidence uh, be able to say I can have I can tell the difference between two people they don't have to do very sophisticated sophisticated things like you know my, my voice print and figure that out you can just say I heard it from this direction I saw him on that vector though that therefore that's the person that gave me that command very very simple to do uh, I'm going to jump over I didn't show you like didn't show you code here so let me actually see if I can get uh, Visual Studio up and show you some of the details And is this up? I'll wait for a second and see if anybody's got, can tell me we've got. Uh... Yeah, we can see you, but you might need to uh, bring your screen res down a bit. Ah, uh, that I can do. See if that'll help a little bit. Yeah, that's a lot. Okay, so basically you'll actually look here. This is some of the code we actually do for the speech recognition. Uh, you can see it's a little bit more than, than what we want to do on PowerPoint. But basically set up the recognizer. Very simple to do. This is basically called once to, to get the Connect recognizer itself. Uh, this gets you the speech recognition engine. That's one of the standards that Microsoft uses. Then you can actually drop down and see the and edit itself. Take the Connect, uh, connect sensor, give it the audio source. Turn off the echo cancellation mode. Uh, what you have to do there is, uh, and the automatic gain control, you have to turn both of those off for speech recognition. Uh, it, it is, you know, you can turn it back on for if you're doing recording, if you're doing audio streaming, or those kind of things. But for that, that we need, we need to make sure that things are uh, that we don't have those because we do need that information for the for the recognition. If you look down at the uh, at the connect, get connect recognizer, that's where you get those four seconds. Make sure and go in there. You can actually see here, right? It's just waiting four seconds. You can actually go in there and check the uh, the recognizer engine and 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 see if it's ready. That's actually probably a better way to do this. I was actually running pretty quickly to put it into place. Uh, we get the in, the engine in place, and you can see that we've got uh, the commands. And I just got a couple of commands here that we've got for the sample: is yes, no, check out, and goodbye. Put those into place. Build a, build a grammar on the current culture that we've got, which is English right now. Uh, we'll append the commands, and we load the grammar for the uh, speech recognition engine. Once we do that, we start the, do the connect audio start. We set the uh, we set that up, and we set up the uh, recognize async. And you can see right down there we've got the uh, we've got the speech recognized. And once we get into that, we've got a you can see I'm at, I'm at a very interesting point where I've got a result.confidence is greater than 0.05, greater than equal to 0.05, which means that I know it's a noisy environment. I'm going to have some trouble getting that back out, retail information, retail store. But at that point, we can actually go through with our cases of uh, I've got a state engine for the card itself, so we can say confirm if it's yes. And we've got multiple states that I can go in there and work with that and see what comes out.
You can see I kept it to one one word uh, commands, but we kept it to a fairly low number of commands. Once you get more than about six commands there, you're going to probably need to break it up and start doing those, some of those command hierarchies to have multiple grammars that it can come through and give you that out. Or manage it yourself with state engines to know what you're getting and in what order that you're pulling that, those uh, commands back in. That makes it very, very uh, interesting to come into place, but you also want to make sure that uh, you're, you're being aware of what's happening there. I'm actually on the uh, on the skeleton uh, event handler uh, doing that steering. I'm actually telling it, here's where the person I'm listening to, here's what's going on, and here's the direction that the, that the angle should be. So you don't see that quite here. And what you'll also see is the... Uh, what you'll also see is that when I lose the skeleton, I put it back to automatic so that we can pick it up wherever and we can actually understand what's happening at that point. So quick quick little run of the code here and back to the presentation. And so that's kind of all the pieces in place, what you're looking at, how you're actually working with the different sensors and uh, what, you're, what you're doing with, uh, with the different capabilities, how you can actually work with those together and put them into place. Uh, this is the where part. Why would you want to use Connect? I mean, we, we've, we actually use the, and, I, and I'll use the, jokingly use the standard, uh, uh, icon, the, the standard term for it, the WIMP interface, Windows Icons Minimize Pointer. Uh, for a long time. Now we've actually got touch interfaces that we're actually making it very accessible and people are, it's very natural for people to do. That being said, what are we working with with Connect and, and, and doing this? Uh, with Connect, it's, as it stands today until we get to 1.5, it's optimized for full body imaging and wa uh, waist to high, uh, head height camera positions. So if you think about situations where you're work working with that, uh, we've got the smarter cart that we're working with that the Connect is pretty much at waist height, which is where the uh, the, the handles of the shopping cart are, works fairly well. If you're working with kiosks or information areas, uh, so, such as public areas and, and, and what people are doing there, you're actually able to work with, with that kind of deal. You're actually able to get that skeleton data in very well. You're actually able to work with people interacting with the with Connect. Very simple. The Connect 1.5 software update uh, supports the sitting skeleton tracking. At that point, there's a lot of interesting scenarios with sitting down and working with it, with able to do a lot of the things, whereas, you know, Minority Report, you see Tom Cruise standing up, but you also see lots of people with desks, and they like that. So being able to go in and say just sitting down and doing gestures as they're working with, with data at, at their uh, if they're in their living room or if they're sitting at their desk, now those kind of scenarios start coming into play. I will say that... Uh, uh, this, the optimized for uh, waist and head height does make a difference. Uh, well, the reason why we were actually uh, uh, pulled off of using the skeleton tracking on the Board of Awesomeness is because at the angle that it was going, which is looking up at the user, uh, the tracking was very difficult. Uh, granted, this is what far outside of the bounds of what the what the team thought about and what they trained the software for. Uh, but that being said, know that if you're getting off of that pretty well, it does get a little bit difficult. Uh, for the smarter cart, we actually do look at uh, it does work for the users looking away or or, st or walking away from the uh, connect, which is you know really nice. But that is uh, a less of a robust solution. How about I put it that way? Uh, for speech recognition, uh, I was mentioning that the depth of skeleton tracking can enable uh, recognition vectoring. They'll be able to say, I want to listen to this person or be able to find out what's going on with different pieces. That makes it very, very useful in noisy environments. And normally when you're work working with Connect, you're probably going to be in a noisy environment. This has always been one of the big troubles with working with uh, speech recognition. If you've ever done any dictation or, or speech recognition on, the, uh, on uh, a, a traditional document or command, Normally they tell you put on a headset, put on a microphone like I'm doing with this uh, with this webcast, and that means that it, you, it knows where you're coming from. If you're doing uh, connect, by definition you've not you you don't have that level of quality. So being able to come in and do that vectoring, be able to do that information becomes very very valuable. Uh, confidence level can be misleading if grammar tabs are close together. We've actually had a, uh, for a lot of our uh, more sophisticated pieces, I showed you some of the samples of the smarter cart, but we've actually had up to 15 commands in there that were several that were, were, you know, were, were tied in with the smarter, with the, uh, uh, 
Board of Awesomeness, we actually had about 20 commands at one point. We had to pull all of those out. Uh, granted, most of those were stop, halt, you know, turn off, lots of different commands to not have it drive away from you and, and be able to turn off the motors by voice if there's any other problems. We try, you know, we, 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 we joke about some of our, our uh, crazy ideas, but we actually do value our skins. Uh, but the thing that you actually get on there is the more can, commands you get, the more chance you have of it getting a false positive or actually doing a connection with one of the other commands. So uh, be aware of that. Make sure that you're actually doing it. That's where I say those serialized commands, be able to drop in grammars that you actually have to have two or three good recognitions or at least decent recognitions to be able to get that uh, command series really makes it helpful if you're doing a lot of commands. If you're doing three or four, then you're probably not going to get a lot of problems there, but just know that you're actually putting it into place. And that goes to the third one, use those multiple word commands for validation, make sure that they're all in place, make sure that things are working the way that you think they should be. Uh, the depth frames, uh, since we're pushing things out, pushing things very hard with the uh, uh, Board of Awesomeness, know that sunlight infrared sources can affect results. We've seen this on both uh, the sunlight with the uh, Board of Awesomeness and some IR sources with the uh, Smarter Cart. It's amazing to see how many things provide, are a bright IR source. Uh, everything from uh, the big uh, big screens to uh, automatic door openers. Actually, um, several models I actually produce very bright IR beacons. So know that that's in place, and know you can actually wash out things there. Um, what happens with the depth frames is you'll generally get good solution, good solution, good solution dropout. There's it doesn't really degrade or, or start giving you pieces. You get uh, you get uh, uh, good Im information all the way up until you get nothing. So know that that's what's happening, that you actually get a lot of tracking that, that works well and then drops out at, at some point. Uh, items in the depth frame have any shadow. Remember that it's actually you using that laser pointer, those dots, to, to tell where everything is. So when, if you're, like, holding your hand up in front of it and it sees your, your hand, there's a shadow behind it that it literally cannot see, and you'll get a, I've got no information on there. Be aware of that. That can actually help you with some things. That can actually you can actually use that to your advantage. But know that you can actually have things that are close, that are but are behind the shadow that you can't see. So know that you're actually working with that. Uh, depth frames are not required to have the same resolution as the video frames. If you're pulling in 640 by 40, or you need really high resolution on the on the video of that. Uh, 1280 uh, resolution. You can actually go for a, a lower depth frame if you just need to kind of know uh, there's something close here or there's something far out there or the user's to the left or the right and I don't want to figure out, I want to do uh, color recognition and I don't want to pay the price of the uh, skeleton tracking. You can actually do a very, uh, a lower resolution and just use that for rough information up there. So using those two together, the depth, the depth frame can give you a lot of information from a fairly low resolution video frame. So you know, always think about that, always think about that uh, data bus that you're working with and get as low as possible. Uh, for the environment itself, Connect is really surprisingly robust for its environment. Uh, we, we were astonished that we were able to get it out and doing as much as possible. Uh, if you saw our board, the, the pic, remember the picture on the uh, board of awesome to begin with, it's does 32 miles an hour down the street through bumps. It's got off-road tires, so we can take it off-road. So it means everything's constantly moving and vibrating and doing all that kind of stuff. The hardware was very robust, and the software is very robust, uh, except for that that uh, skeleton tracker, which we, we really pushed it too far. But the depth frame gives us a lot of information. The video is actually really, really nice and be able to put it in place. So very, very robust and very, very, you know, when you're putting it into an environment, I'm really sure you're not going to put it as far as, I pushed it as far as we did, and we were, we've were we been very happy with outcomes together. The IR washout is the biggest factor. Uh, we actually did some other, other uh, pieces because we have such sunny days here, uh, but basically we were incredibly surprised at how far it would, how far it would work on the washout and work with that. And the camera angle is the biggest factor for that skeleton tracking. If you can actually get it at waist height, at the level that, at the distances that it was trained for, you get some really, really good information off the skeleton tracking. But if you don't have that, if you're not able to do that, if you're able to push that too far, then you're going to have problems and know that no matter how you're doing that, that skeleton information is going to be fairly noisy and fairly jittery. Uh, know that uh, you can actually, especially if you're doing like we do, uh, 
when we're moving around, we're actually moving, uh, doing the moving the camera with our different uh, devices. Uh, you'll, you'll drop out on the scale of tracking until we can re until settle things down. Uh, if one of the things you're probably going to be doing is doing the tilt, maybe bring it up or bring it down to make sure that the user is best in frame uh, for wherever they're standing. Know that you're actually going to get frame dropouts. You're not going to get skeleton uh, skeleton frames for a period of time where the software kind of re readjusts to what the camera angle is and what it's seeing. So those are going to be the pieces with the skeleton, with the skeleton tracking that the angle and the motion of the connect itself is going to be the biggest factor. Most people aren't going to run into it like we did. Here's, here's my slide for further information. Uh, Connectforwindows.com gets you all the information on development, gets you SDK, gets you all the samples. Oh, uh, I've, got a, I've got a question. I'm sorry, I just looked up. Uh, is the raw audio information available from the Connect? Uh, Yes, you can actually pull in all of the audio. You can actually use it for uh, audio streaming. You can do whatever else you want to. You can record things off of it. Absolutely. You don't just have to use the speech recognition SDK. Uh, to be honest with you, uh, we haven't done a lot with that on our projects with just raw data. That doesn't mean that it's not. We actually have a, a, a project that we will be using the raw data with. Uh, for, for some interesting voice messaging and for picking up and, and doing that. Uh, but we haven't, you know, we haven't done that yet. We've been, basically been working with commands instead of pulling in that raw sound. So uh, hopefully that's, the, yeah, you can absolutely have all of that in there. And you also, when you're doing the raw data, you still get the information such as uh, the vector information. You don't get confidence, of course, because it's not doing, uh, it's not doing that, but you get all of the information there. Uh, oh, the only piece is you asked which mic. Uh, you don't get, you, uh, I'm not aware of any piece, I haven't run across it, where you, you can get just off of one mic. It views the mic array as one audio source because that's how it gives you those vectoring and actually can do some of the noise canceling and, and echo correction off of that. Okay. Um, Back to the further information, sorry about that. Uh, the Connect for Windows team blog is very, very useful. If you go on there, you can find the information, uh, some of the some of the details. They were talking about the new Connect for Windows 1.5 SDK, which is definitely worth keeping an eye on. Uh, know that there are doing updates to the SDK even between the major releases. So keep an eye on there, keep track, uh, because they're, they're doing a lot of work on the software. It's evolving very rapidly. They're doing a lot of really, really cool things with it. So I definitely want to keep it on there. Um, the channel line tags connect. That's able to go in there, and you can actually see a lot of projects, a lot of source code, a lot of other ideas around what to do with Connect. And, of course, our projects page, uh, chaoticmoon.com labs. We've got the smarter cart, and we've got the Board of Awesomeness up there. You can see what we're doing, some of the details on that. Uh, we're trying to get some uh, – and we're working through uh, open sourcing those projects. So we can get them out there and let you play with them, but uh, there's some – our legal counsel's working with that. Uh, we want to make sure that you have that. Uh, and we'll have some more projects up there that you'll be able to see very soon. Uh, at that point, we're at the, at the Q&A, and I see some uh, questions coming up. So let me jump over to those, and we'll drop those in. Uh, negative impacts of having multiple connects running close to each other and not necessarily co connected to the same PC. This That's an excellent question, Tom. Um, basically, it's... From our experience, the connects themselves don't interfere with each other all that much. It actually surprised us uh, when we're running several of them around. They actually worked fairly well. Fairly well, they behave with each other. A lot of it's because the way the uh, laser projector is working is it's giving out a. It's called a semi-random, uh, semi-random field of dots. And each one knows where its dots are, so it, it tends to ignore any of the other ones, or if the dots are not in the right place that it knows they are. Um, not, the, I'm not sure all the details and the math behind that, but it works really well. That being said, you you have a lot more trouble with very bright unmodulated IR sources, things like IR beacons, like I mentioned, the door openers that use an IR a strong IR signal to. Uh, uh, to kind of wash an area and see what comes back. Uh, all of those are really what you've run into. Um, we haven't tried more than two connects together. If you've got like four or five that are that are pointed in the same area, if they're not connected to, you know, you can have multiples if you're running multiple systems. Uh, you don't want them overlapping too much, but so far we haven't had 
a lot of problems with that. It, it, unless it's been very robust on there. Um, those are the questions that we have. If there are any other questions, please drop them in. I'd be glad to uh, answer. Quiet crowd. Yeah, sometimes it happens, Phil. <laughs> Come on, <laughs> no, 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 I'm sure you've got something you want to ask him. Well, while we're, while we're, oh, we got another one. Uh, is there a way to keep the connect from going to sleep during inactive periods? Um, actually, the, that's a that's an interesting question because a lot of times the question that people ask is exactly the opposite. Uh, this is uh, this is from Brian. Uh, basically, what happens is once you start the connect going, once you turn on the the IR source, the the base for the beacon, connect. Doesn't doesn't time out, uh, or we haven't we haven't let it sit long enough to do. Uh, if you've seen a situation like that, I'd be interesting to hear interested to hear for, uh, hear about it. Uh, but what happens, and a lot of people are concerned about, it, is once it comes on, there's not really a way to go. Okay, turn the turn the uh, uh, dot pattern off again because I don't want to maybe use power on the battery or uh, interfere with other things, or I just you know don't want to take the lifespan of the laser on on there. So. Uh, basic, basically, the connect itself, once it's running and once you're getting those, that information, you're going to keep getting it. Uh, the, you can turn off, you can stop the connect sensor, you can stop uh, getting information from it, but the connect itself will keep at least broadcasting the, the dot pattern. Ah, here we go with good questions. Uh, Ken? I've uh, got your question here. Are any plans to add gesture recognition to the SDK? There has been nothing announced uh, on that. I know there's a lot of interest in that. There's actually some good, if you look on CodePlex, there's some actually some good toolkits for doing gesture recognition. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, so uh, there's some stuff out there right now, even though it's not officially part of the Connect SDK. You can run it on top of it. You can actually pick that up and work with the gestures. Key with gesture recognition is movement over time. Uh, when you're working with just the depth, in depth frame, it's fairly simple. When you're working with the uh, skeleton tracking, that jitter does tend to mean that you need to work with, with different pieces. Uh, I, I want to say check with Connect and CodePlex, and there's several really good tools I've seen on there that, that can help you with that. Uh, and I, I would not be surprised at all if that comes into the SDK at some point in the future. Uh, but uh, right now, no, I have not seen any comments on that. Uh, Facial recognition. Uh, I, at this point, there is no facial recognition in the Connect for uh, Connect for Windows SDK. Uh, I know there's a lot of interest in that. Um, I have actually seen at CES uh, then Microsoft showing off the capability using Connect, but so far it's not in the SDK. So uh, I'm not sure if they're still working on the details, if they're working on uh, uh, kind of making it more robust. But we've seen Connect doing it, but I have not heard of if or when it's going to be in the SDK itself. I would suspect that you're going to see that at some point, but I don't know if it, that, that it may be. I've seen it with this generation of hardware, but I don't know if they may wait for, uh, for general release until possibly a Connect V2. Uh, Peter, uh, is there a path to use Connect for things other than Xbox and PC, Arduino, uh, all of those, Lego Mindstorms? Um, Connect for Windows SDK is just for Windows, actually just for Windows. Uh, if you want to use it for uh, Xbox 360, you need to actually have the Xbox uh, SDK, which is uh, a little bit more controlled. Um, that being said, there are toolkits and there are uh, drivers for doing, uh, for running it from all manner of devices. I've seen it all the way down to processing. I, Arduino, uh, I've seen some people working on that part of that's bandwidth and pulling things into place. I've seen people working with it with micro framework. I've seen people working with it with uh, Linux distributions and all those kind of things. So that's capable, but it's not going to be with the Microsoft SDKs. <laughs> ah, uh, Robert, when you use the, the board of awesomeness, uh, does passing under three branches other things like that interfere with the gesture recognition? Normally it does not. 
we actually ran into only one situation where we had trouble with that. And ironically, it wasn't running past things that are close by. It was actually running past shiny objects. Uh, when we were running down one of the sidewalks, and yes, sorry, we were, we, we were testing on the sidewalk because traffic was, we didn't want our, our test pilot killed. Um, in, in traffic, uh, we actually ran by a area that had shiny, uh, uh, shiny windows, uh, very big display windows, and we were actually picking up uh, reflections off of that for the for the LEDs or for the for the IR uh, dots, and we had some trouble there. That being said, uh, we were able to do that and check and see. Uh, basically, what we're doing, if things jump, be able to smooth that out. Uh, in software, you can actually check with that. Uh, but know that normally, uh, branches or other things like that, depending on how far away you are, you're able to make, to check with that. Uh, check your hitbox and check where your how your depth that you're working with. Uh, know kind of where you're doing, and if you're if you're able to do work with that, then you're probably going to have problems with things running behind there. Stephen. Uh, if you don't connect app uh, for Windows, what are the challenges using that for an Xbox app? Or should I just focus on an Xbox app if that is my target? Uh, if you're wanting to have it on Xbox, I would work with the Xbox SDK. The two are similar, and there's actually a lot of work to keep them together. Uh, but know that you're going to be in a very different environment on Xbox developing than you are going to be on Windows, mainly because the Xbox environment is a lot more controlled whereas you've got a lot more freedom or, or are able to do a lot more things on the, the Connect for Windows side. Um, if you're looking for publishing on Xbox and going through the, the marketplace, I would start with that and, and not I – mean, you can prototype on the Connect for Windows. That's something that kind of helps you prove out the concept, but if you're really kind of wanting to start there and then move it to, to the Xbox, if you know that's your target, I'd start there. Uh, Brian. Uh, what do you believe is the biggest impact the Connect or NUI will have for how we interact both socially and professionally? Um, I, I love this question. I actually see uh, that the Connect for the Connect interfaces or natural user interfaces, to be, to be specific, are going to help us move away from going to our computer. These are the interfaces that we're actually going to take, and uh, part of the reason why Labs was founded is, is we're looking at the three, three types of computing: pervasive, perceptive, and predictive. Pervasive computing needs NUI because with pervasive, you don't go to your computer. Your computer is always around you. And if you're not doing that, uh, if you have to go to a station or if you're doing that, then it's just computing there. I think NUI is going to be the thing that allows us to have not a, not the computer in your house, but your house as a computer. It actually allows you to do things like predicting what you're wanting to do. If you're able to say, see that you went into your kitchen, uh, you got a bowl of popcorn, maybe I ought to have the TV already ready and queued up for you because you're probably going to go in to watch a movie uh, in your media room. Or you're heading to the door and you didn't pick up your keys, remind you on that way out. I think that's going to be uh, that, that connect and, and various uh, sensors like that are going to be what enables us to have our environment and our, our, our computers really start helping us and offloading those, remembering things and, and keeping out on things to the computer and let us do more of what people do best, which is create and put things in place. Um, Tom, how do you tie an external microphone to a Connect event? Um, basically, if you want to use an external microphone, uh, you would not use the Connect events because that's kind of tied in separately. Uh, the Connect Windows SDK is really tied into those specific uh, microphones. Uh, you can actually use some of the recognition engines and, and those kind of things outside of the Connect SDK, but you're going to have to roll your own, and it does take a bit of work. So if you're needing extra microphone, that's going to be separate from what's going on there. You can do it, again, because the SD, it is a Connect SDK. You can use it with other capabilities, but it is going to be a different pull-in for that. Um, Ken. Is the firmware in the Connect for Windows field upgradable, or does a new firmware require a new Connect unit? Um, I, my understanding, and this is just my personal understanding, because I know that the Connect uh, for 360, the 360 Connect is upgradable, and I've seen it upgraded a couple of times. So the Connect for Windows should be field upgradable. I don't know if it's happened yet. If it has, I haven't, I haven't noticed it. Uh, but I would assume that capability is there. That is purely an assumption on my part, but uh, I know that the capability is actually in for the Xbox 360 Connect. 
So there's no reason why it would not be in for the Connect for Windows. Uh, how will Connect behave with a sudden with sudden change in light? Open a door, switch on a bright light, etc. Uh, that's an excellent question. Uh, generally, we have seen it handle it very well. Uh, this is one of those things where kind of being outdoors and moving from shadow to light to back, back to shadow again when we're moving around town. Uh, we've seen Connect work really well. Um, if you're, yeah, I mean, you are going to get things like you're going to get the brighter video, you're going to get darker video, those kind of deals. But because the depth camera is is IR, uh, you're going to see everything pretty much standard all the way up until you hit that cutoff point. Now, when you hit the cutoff point and it gets too bright for the IR, then you lose tracking and, and it'll let you know uh, because everything will all of a sudden go out of range. But uh, but basically, you're, you're, it handles, handles the movement very well. Uh, it does not do a lot of dynamic uh, dynamic scaling on the video. Uh, you'll need to do some of that brightness level there. But you know you get access to the frames and, and you're able to do a lot of that work in, inside of there. Uh, is it true that the hardware in the Kinect was originally developed for the Israeli Defense Force Missile Guidance Program? I do know that a lot of the technology was developed from an, uh, a firm in Israel. I do not know what they were doing with it. Um, I, I could see the usefulness of it, but I could also see that uh, if I was doing, if I was going to make a uh, 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 missile guidance program, I would probably not be using IR in this uh, for depth. I'd be using something very, very different. So I think that may, I don't know. I'm not going to say it's not true, uh, but that's maybe a bit of an exaggeration. How, we, how about we put it that way? And, and I won't speak for the team that, uh, that put it together. <laughs> okay, I think that's, uh, oh, there's one. Uh, can I bridge more than one connect for more coverage? Uh, that's an excellent question. Uh, I mentioned that you can have up to four connects working off there. The, the SDK actually supports that. Uh, the only thing I would, uh, it, it depends upon how you're working with it. Uh, the connects themselves can give you back the information. It's up to you to do things like, excuse me, know what angle the connects are all at, know what they're looking at, because each one of them is going to give you back the information relative to itself. So you would need to do some calibration on those, depending upon what direction they were looking, how did they over, if there if there was any overlap, or working with the direction, the fields of view, uh, and. And I'm trying to remember if this changed. I don't want to say it unless uh, the last time I was I was looking at the multiple connects and tracking, which was I haven't I haven't checked in the last couple of point releases that only one connect could give you the skeleton tracking. You couldn't do skeleton tracking on all of the connects, uh, so you would be getting depth depth and video information. You could actually get audio information from each one of those connects, but the skeleton tracker would only be working off one of your connects so that you would that, that would be your piece for using that information. But if you're working with depth information, you're working with video information, uh, all of that's capable of, of, of using up to four connects to maybe do a 360, uh, 360 view and, and interaction with an application, which would be really cool in my opinion. Other than keeping the skeleton in frame, are there other circumstances where an application would want to operate the tilt motor? Um, I'll, I'll give you the example we had on the Sparta cart. One of the things we wanted to do was actually use the same connect for two purposes. One, we wanted to do uh, keep track of the person, be able to track what they're doing, be able to do the voice recognition, but be able to actually follow them around and use it for navigation. The second thing we were going to use the connect motor for, the connect for, and we were going to use the motor to tilt down, was we wanted to look down into the shopping cart. We wanted to actually do a height map of everything in there and be able to keep track of of how many items were in the cart. So we could actually say, you know, you have five items in the cart. I've recognized five items have come in. You have six items in the cart. You start something in or something happened. Hey, can you help me keep track of the inventory or we'll need to take you over to the manual checkout kind of thing rather than do an auto checkout if I've already got everything scanned. Uh, that's why we were kind of looking at, at tilting it down. Uh, I could think of other situations that you might want to do with doing a navigation with the ro with the robot being able to do uh, a complete uh, scan of the area, and be able to do full height, uh, be able to see how close things are, and those kind of things. But there are some interesting things you can do with the with the tilt. Uh, we couldn't use it for that with our project because 
we couldn't get it low enough off of the horizontal to look in with our with our uh, mounting location. It's something that we're you know we were looking at doing a separate servo for that we might be able to do to uh, to get it deeper and to be able to do that. Uh, Ricardo, uh, when working in event mode, are the frames in sync? For example, is RGB frame in sync with a depth frame? If so, when I receive the RGB frame, is associated with the current depth frame? They are not specifically in sync. Uh, actually, they're, you're getting them, depending upon the, fr the frames per second, you could actually get them, uh, if you're doing 12 frames per second for the video and you're getting 30 frames per second for the depth, obviously you're not going to get them one-to-one -one matching. So you're, you're going to get them... Uh, you can get some timers off of them, you can get counts off of them, so you can actually manually figure out which one's close to the other, uh, but you're not going to get them a one-to-one -one match on what you're doing. And uh, even if you're doing the same frame rates, uh, you're going to probably be very close, but it's not going to be exact one-to-one -one match because of various situations. Uh, Brian, uh, we've all seen Minority World Report, and one of the first conceptual, pe uh, conceptual ideas people have when considering the characters based on that. Uh, but that's a futuristic perception. Uh, we're seeing a lot more innovation around it. So when do you think the paradigm shift will happen from a, the touchy-feely UIs today and NUI? Um, actually, I think that's up to us. I think that people are interested in it. I think that currently Xbox is doing a great job of, you know, the, with their uh, with their you are the controller idea of watching you working with that. Uh, I think for Connect to kind of take that next step, though, is going to be us making the new applications, actually taking it and putting it not just in the game room. It's not just, you know, uh, doing playing basketball virtually or things like that, but being able to go in and say, you know, uh, I'm, I'm trying not to say a couple of our projects because I want to surprise you with them, but being able to take it out into the rest of the world, to be able to do things like uh, an information kiosk at the airport, to be able to walk up, have be able to say, uh, have, a, have the kiosk instead of standing up there and having, uh, if you've been in the airport and seen the uh, a dozen screens, you have to find the right screen, be able to walk up and say, here it is, next, 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 and get exactly to the one that you want to rather than having to wait for things to cycle through. Being able to do things such as even even have uh, some additional identity with things such as ratios of, uh, ratios of uh, joints or some of the facial recognition we're talking about that may be coming in, in 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 the future to be able to have you walk up, pick up your identity, and give you your information. Oh, your 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 flight, your connecting flight is is to your right. Uh, it's down at gate four. There'll be four gates. And by the way, you ordered on your in-flight Wi-Fi. You ordered a uh, a meal because you're not going to have enough time to sit down. That's waiting for you at the uh, food court at so and so. You know those kind of things. That's the things we're going to be giving them to, and that's what's going to really make things interesting. Uh, the minority report. I think there's going to be that's going to be very interesting. I, I, I do see people doing things like that, but uh, you know it, it, it's you got to be trained in on that. One of the nice things that MultiTouch made people happy about is people didn't have to be trained. We're needing to take that NUI and putting it into that place to make that happen. Uh, Tom, are there any problems if you mount the connect at a non-level base, base on bottom angles, 90, 180 degrees? Uh, the main thing is on that skeleton tracking. If you're doing things from a angle that's not expecting, uh, other than that, uh, you're again you're going to get those depth frames just like you expect. You're going to get the video frames, uh, audio. You're going to have the remember the audio vector is basically a horizontal plane. Uh, normal to the or, or parallel to the connect sensor, so know that you're going to change that uh, that angle a bit. Uh, but the connect itself is happy with however you mount it. We've actually done some very interesting tests on that. Uh, Ryan, is connect able to track fingers, open or closed hand? Not through the SDK. I've seen some people working on that, especially with near mode, uh, with the depth information. They've been doing it. And they're able to tell the difference. Uh, in their own software, but the SDK itself only tracks the hand and wrist. It does not track fingers. Uh, Brian, did you ever look at Second Light from Manus Labs and working connection with Connect? Um, I have seen Second Light, but only in what's available publicly. I, I really like the idea, uh, especially the the idea of overlaying data on data in the physical world. Uh, that being said, I don't have any updates. So I don't know where that project is because I haven't heard about it in a little bit. Um, I, I just don't have any information at all. I, I apologize about that because I, I think that's a, that's a fascinating project. Um, 
I'd love to hear more about it myself from the from the teens. Uh, okay, thanks, Tom. Uh, and I we're I, I just uh, got told we're two minutes over, so I, I think we're we have fi finished up the queue, so I think we're in great shape. Thank you guys for attending, and hopefully it was useful and and uh, worth your time. Fantastic. Philip, that was uh, that was uh, pretty brilliant, right? Um, you covered a lot of angles in the Q&A, and you went quite in-depth on some of the utilizations uh, for the Kinect. I'm pretty sure our members here seriously enjoyed uh, listening to you all answering the questions and presenting the topic tonight. I've got to admit, I enjoyed it as well. Um, thanks for presenting for us. My pleasure, my pleasure. Fantastic. Okay, well, thank you to everybody. Uh, and just a reminder to those that are left, um, I will be notifying the winners of the Pluralsight subscription uh, in the next 24 hours. So check your inbox and make sure you have info at linux.org or brian.matson at